Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And in today's video, we're gonna take a look at 3D equilibrium. So of course on equilibrium, we need to start with our free body diagram and then move into equilibrium. I'm gonna fold these together into the lecture today just because you've already looked at two-dimensional free body diagrams and moved into two-dimensional equilibrium. We separated those into separate days. Because you have that background, we should be able to combine these into a single kind of cohesive package. So if we think about equilibrium, equilibrium of course is summing forces and summing moments. And so sum of all forces equal to zero, coming from Newton's second law where acceleration is equal to zero. Splitting that now into three dimensions, we have sum of forces in the x equals zero, sum of forces in the y equals zero, and sum of forces in the z direction equal zero. Now keep in mind that these x, y, and z are always part of a right-hand coordinate system where x crossed into y always has to be positive z. Now keep in mind these coordinate systems don't always have to be going the exact same direction. We also have a right-hand coordinate system which is x crossed into y is z going upwards in the page. Now keep in mind as we look at z here or x, and these are the axis systems that are fundamentally coming out of your screen. Okay, so while in this one X and Y are in the plane of the of the screen, in this one Y and Z are in the plane of the screen, in this one Z and X are coming out of the screen. So um, once again, we need a right-hand coordinate system as we deal with three-dimensional problems. Getting into summing moments, we're going to sum moments about those same three axes, sum moments. Now, again, with equilibrium, just like in two-dimensional equilibrium, we can sum moments about any point that we want. Okay, there's a lot of strategy that could go into that, and I'll talk about kind of a different approach where you want to sum moments, all moments about a point, or if you want to isolate moments around each axis. So an equivalent set of three equations would be to sum the moment about the x equals zero, summing the moment about the y axis equals zero, and summing the moment about the z axis equals zero. Now, when I talk about summing moments about axes with three these three equations right here, it's fundamentally saying the same thing as summing your moment about the origin and then isolating the x component, the y component, and the z component. Right, because if you took your sum of moment, moment of all forces and couples around your origin and then dotted those onto the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, you'd end up with these exact same equations. Okay, so just kind of showing that parallel. Um, or like I said, we can sum moments about some other point that we'd like to. So as we think about this, and let me just write this out, there's two options for summing moments. Option number one, I'm gonna say is kind of the most robust option for complicated systems. Okay, so robust for complicated I'll say complicated loading. Okay, so if you have a whole bunch of forces, especially a whole bunch of multi-dimension forces, two and three dimensional forces, two and three dimensional R vectors, I think you're gonna be better off to just go ahead and sum moments about one single point for every single force in the whole thing, then split it into an X version, a Y version, and a Z version. Okay, so robust for complicated loading would be to sum all moments. This is both R cross F and also a couple moments about one point. Then split into X, Y, and Z equations. So really this is kind of referring to this one, right? Summing moments all about one single point, then isolating in the X, the Y, and the Z. The second option here works well if you have systems that are really easier to get your head around, okay? So we're gonna call these um, quick solution for simple loading. Okay. 
So if you only have a handful of moments, and most of those moments are coming from one-dimensional R vectors, one-dimensional force vectors, it might be easy enough to just look at that drawing and figure out, and the drawing, of course, I'm talking about is your free body diagram, figuring out what your moments are around your three axes. Okay, so in this case, we would directly write our sum moment about the x equals zero, sum moment about the y equals zero, and sum moment about the z equals zero. So we're really talking about these equations over here. So there is no right or wrong answer which of these options that you choose. One of them, like I said, is essentially relying upon your determinants, your cross products, very, very robust, very methodical, that's number one. The quick solution, you know, possibly you could even look, and if you're pretty good at doing the right-hand rule on three-dimensional problems with just your hand, you could come up with the perpendicular distances and the force magnitudes and like write out all of the vector components into equation form without going through a full determinant, okay? And so I'll leave that up to you. I'd say that on three-dimensional problems, Probably 70% of them, I'm going to go with number one. So that kind of becomes my default. If I take a look at it and say, hey, there's only a couple forces and I can visualize what these forces are doing, what kind of moments they're causing, I may jump into method two. Okay. And so the steps for doing three-dimensional equilibrium are exactly the same as the steps for doing two-dimensional equilibrium. And that is you need to create a free body diagram by isolating, adding axes, adding your um, reactions, your loading, and then finally dimensions. And once again, dimensions are optional in my book. So that's creating a free body diagram, then writing your equations. Now in solving for the equations, as we think about having up to six equations with up to six unknowns, this is certainly a case where some linear algebra solutions may be a really good benefit for you um, to solve some of these problems. Now, I am conscious if, as you think forward to exams, I do um, not put, um, basically equation sets on an exam that would require you to need a linear algebra solution um, on an exam. I find ways around that. Um, but certainly on homework and as you're working through and learning this material, um, using a linear algebra solution is going to be, um, like I said, a benefit because you're getting to up, up to six equations, up to six unknowns. So now moving on to interpreting supports and finding out what kind of reactions they add to our free body diagram, right? So just remember as we talk about this topic that supports are physical, okay? So that's physically what is actually supporting a three-dimensional body, where reactions are kind of a, a model. There are computational model or, or um, conceptual model of how we can idealize these physical supports, okay? So this is, um, to put that even simpler, these are the forces and couples that show up on your free body diagram, right? Because a free body diagram fundamentally is a model of the physical system, okay? Now, on this table, and this does come from the Engineering Statics textbooks, textbook, I have once again kind of clustered all of the different support types that give exactly the same reaction, okay? So we'll go through these one by one. Here in the upper left, we have anything that's a two-force support. Now, I only drew a cable on here. You could also have a, um, a weightless pinned link. Realize that in three dimensions, we actually don't just have, um, two, you know, similar to two-dimensional pins, we actually have what are called ball and sockets. And so we'll get to this as we scroll down the page. But essentially, if you have a member that is massless, has a ball and socket at both ends, that's gonna become a two force member. And so that two force member carries one single internal force, which is either intention or compression. I've drawn this here pulling. So we would assume that as I drew it here, this would be in tension, um, but it could also be in compression, right? Compression pushes. And so if I had compression, it'd be pushing down that way. That'd be compression. Tension pulls, compression pushes. Um, also, we have normal forces, right? Normal forces come from the contact of one body with a surface, and so the normal force is always perpendicular to that surface. And so if we have 
a smooth surface and we either have the body simply touching a smooth surface or if we have a roller on a smooth surface um, either one of those cases give us one single normal force perpendicular to that surface so moving down the table getting into more and more complex reactions here next up we have a ball and socket joint so keep in mind that reaction forces prevent translation reaction couples prevent rotation Okay, we talked about that with two-dimensional bodies as well. So if we have a ball and socket joint, it is free to rotate in all directions. If this is free to rotate in all directions, then essentially we will not have any reaction couples, but a ball and socket joint is going to prevent translation in all directions, and preventing translation tells us that we have reaction forces. So we model this as three independent reaction forces, one in the X, one in the Y, one in the Z. Okay, so that is a ball and socket joint. Moving now to look at a free axle bearing. Okay, a free axle bearing is also sometimes called a journal bearing. So a journal bearing or a free axle bearing means that the bearing itself, the dark gray part of this bar, can not only rotate in this body freely, but also can slide freely through this body. Okay, so it can both slide and rotate freely. And so there's not going to be any reactions along the length of that gray bar, but there's going to be both force reactions. Okay, we're basically going to say that this gray bar cannot translate in the y direction. It cannot translate in the z direction. There's prevention of that. It also can't rotate around those same two axes. Okay, so as you're learning about these reaction couples, this resistance to rotation of this gray bar, keep in mind that, say, for a free axle bearing, this is going to be true of other bearing styles as well, that you're automatically going to have a reaction couple and reaction force on both axes, which are perpendicular to the bar itself, okay, to the axle itself. Okay, so like I said, once again, this is basically rotating as we look down from the top of the page, that we won't have a rotation around this direction. And then this Y right here is not rotating as you're looking kind of along the, along the brown surface here, that basically the left and right ends can't go up and down. Okay, the resistance to rotation in both the Z and the Y. A confined axle bearing, which is also called a thrust bearing. Now let me just label this here. So a free axle, we said, is also known as a journal bearing. And a confined axle bearing is also known as a thrust bearing. So a thrust bearing essentially saying that the bearing housing can support thrust along the length of that axle. So let me give you a little story here about what we'd want to use, where we'd want to use a thrust bearing versus one to use a journal bearing. So when I was in college, I was a tour boat captain on some lakes up in Glacier National Park in Montana. And so this is fundamentally what our boat looked like. It was about 50 feet long. And coming out the back here, there was a propeller. Okay, and so that propeller is going to interact with the water. But it turned out that the motor for this boat was way up front. Okay, so here's my motor. And here's the propeller. And so there's going to be a drive shaft which goes all the way from the motor back to the propeller. So if you think about how any propeller, it doesn't matter if it's a water propeller or a air propeller, right, for an airplane, but essentially you're going to have the motor, and the motor is going to spin the propeller, right, so it's going to spin around, basically um, spin in the, or around an axis that's in the plane of the page, okay, if we wanted to draw that as a rotational vector, essentially that the boat is adding a moment as I drew it here, we could say that that moment would look like this as a double-headed arrow, right? So that's spinning around. So this propeller is interacting with the water as it's spinning. And there's basically, because of the um, kind of rotated faces of that propeller, there's going to be an interaction force that's going to be picked up in this drive shaft. Okay, so this force we want to transfer to the boat. And so the design of this boat actually had a very, very large thrust bearing 
right back at the very rear of the boat because we wanted to transfer that axial force into the boat itself as opposed to coming all the way through this drive shaft. The problem with a whole bunch of compression in a drive shaft is that it increases the chance the drive shaft could buckle. Now I'll say that these other bearings, these were journal bearings. So these are also, these are our free axle bearings. And the reason we get our free axle bearings after the thrust bearing is because the force from that propeller had already been picked up by the thrust bearing. And so these free axle or journal bearings are really just holding that drive shaft in place and keeping it rotating in a straight line. Um, so my comment there about having a whole bunch of thrust and buckling, say that one of these journal bearings failed and then you started to get some some flex of that drive shaft, right? Keep in mind it's spinning, right? At, at um, RPM, hundreds of RPM, probably even to the low thousands of RPM. It was a diesel motor, so it was kind of a low RPM. Um, anyways, but it would not be a safe situation to have a drive shaft buckle and then break through the floor of your um, boat and into the passengers, and it would be it'd be like a Sharknado. It'd be horrible. So that just gives you an idea of where you might use a thrust bearing versus where you might use a journal bearing in an engineering design context. So again, notice here that a thrust bearing allows for or picks up some force along its axial length. And we get the exact same kind of interaction for a pin, right? This is analogous to our two-dimensional pin, but in this case, we're not going to allow this member to slide per parallel to that pin. And the same thing happens for a hinge, right? You look at these barrels that are basically welded to each one of these faces that they're not going to allow the door fundamentally, if this is a, a door hooked to a hinge, the door's not going to be able to slide downward, right? It's going to resist with a force in that direction. But the other forces and couples are exactly the same between a free axle bearing and also a confined axle bearing. So once again, the standards are a resistant force and resistant couple perpendicular to motion. Let me take off that highlight. It doesn't do well with the red. Um, and the same things for confined axle bearing plus we have this resistant force. And then a square axle bearing, which isn't real typical because most bearings are designed to carry something rotating. And of course a square axle bearing can't. But the thing that we pick up in a square axle bearing is basically a resistance to rotation because of the square axle. Okay, so that would be our standard four plus one. So again, five reactions. And then the final support we have is a fixed support. And this fixed support can resist all six reactions. And so if you have one of these in your problem and you have all of these as unknowns, you're gonna have six equations with six unknowns just to solve for the fixed supports. All right. Now, one of the very interesting things that happens as we have more than one support on a body is that they're going to interact, okay? And as they interact, it turns out that sometimes, and I'll say most of the time, when you have pairs of these supports, that quite often the, the couples won't be engaged. Okay, so I have a whole separate page to talk about that topic. So I know that you've just trying to get your head around what is a reaction couple. And so if you need to pause the video and kind of let that sink in, that a reaction couple is a resistance to rotation, I'm totally fine with that. Because now I'm also going to talk about that it's not 100% of the time that we need those couples. There's times they're engaged, there's times they're not, okay? So let's talk about first about engaged versus not engaged. So if I have a system, and we'll pick something kind of simple here. Let's say I have a two-dimensional system that I have a block sitting on a surface, and it happens to be also against a wall, okay? So I have a wall here, and so as we think about a free body diagram of this block, we would have a weight force, there's gonna be a normal force, and there's potentially a normal force, so call this N1, N2, and weight. Let's blow this up a little bit. Okay, so there's these forces which are potential, okay?
But if there's no horizontal forces on this block, there's no way we're going to need N2. Okay, so in this context, if this block's sitting horizontally and we don't add any horizontal forces, we'd say that N2 is available but not engaged. Now, if we switch this up a little bit and we rotated the system, so now um, maybe this is on a tilting bed, and so now we have a situation where our weight force is still vertical. Our normal force N1 um, still exists perpendicular to that surface, and now we also have N2. And so in this case, N2 was equal to zero, and we said that it was not engaged. And in this case, we're going to say that N2 is greater than zero because we need it, right? So it is engaged. So hopefully that helps you think about this, I, the, these words, not engaged versus engaged. Okay, so things are available, but we don't always need them. All right. So looking at this context of um, couples and forces. So this is the basic statement. Support forces engage before support couples. Okay, so if you have support forces available, they are going to be used before the support couples. And so it really comes down to how many supports you have, which and I call these multi-component supports. So these don't really count for like two force members or normal supports, right? The ones with just one single force. We're talking about the ones from the table with the hinges, the bearings, the fixed supports, right? That have multiple forces and likely also multiple couples. If there's only one of those, If there's only one of those multi-component supports, assume you'll need every single support couple available. Okay, so essentially you're going to need all the support couples from that support in order to, to hold things in equilibrium. If you have two or more, it's a pretty safe assumption to assume that the couples will not be engaged. Okay, couples are likely not engaged for equilibrium. And the big test of this really comes down here. So this is question two. Once you've gone through that analysis, how many unknowns are you left with? Okay, how many unknowns are you left with in the problem? We know we only have six equations. If by getting rid of those couples, you have equal to or less than six, it's likely ready to start some force in some moment. Um, if you have greater than six, you likely need to get rid of more of those couples. Okay, or maybe you misinterpreted one of the supports and what kind of reactions you get from that support, right? So this is like a stop sign. If you hit this and you have more than six unknowns, and it doesn't matter why you have more than six unknowns, you better go back to your free body diagram and reevaluate, okay? Because you cannot solve for more than six unknowns given our equations currently in statics. And so here's two of those situations, two of those scenarios. The one on the left, we have one single of these free axle, hence journal bearings at A. We also have a couple of two force members, a cable, which is a cable at DE and a cable at CF. As we contrast that with the one over here on the right, we have a pair of bearings, typo here, therefore. Um, we have a journal bearing, which is a free axle bearing at A. So that's at A. We have a thrust bearing, which is a has restricted movement of that axle at B. Okay, so we know that journal bearings have four available unknowns, right? So there's like four reactions that could come from here. We know that a thrust bearing has five available unknowns. Okay, and then everything else in this problem is actually specified. Um, I take it back with the exception, I guess T, I forget if T was an unknown as this problem was framed or not. But anyways, four plus five is nine. Bad things, man. Like there's no way that you can solve for nine unknowns given only six equations. Okay, so if you get rid of the two couples, then we're at two. 
for A, right, we're up to two reaction forces perpendicular. And let me just highlight here, right, they're perpendicular to the drive shaft. Um, now I'm going to commit a free body diagram sin of, of not isolating first, but we're basically going to pick up one force along the X, one force along the Z, right, perpendicular to the axle. And then over here at B, if we get rid of two different reactions, this comes down to three. Okay, so we're now at two, four, so we went from nine unknowns, now here's five, and if we pick up another one here at T, we're only at six. And again here, we have a force in the Z and a force in the X, perpendicular to that axle. Oh, and this is a thrust bearing, so one along its length as well. All right, so that's the general idea as we look at how many supports we have, what types of supports they are. Our goal is always to get less than six unknowns. If you have more than six, you need to continue to evaluate your free body diagram. Thanks for your attention today.